Good morning. So uh, a few years ago, I was gifted from a uh, from an outgoing colleague their astrodynamics and orbital mechanics uh, lecture course, and it was a delight. Um, so astrodynamics is a fundamentally four dimensional problem, and up until a few years ago, it was taught by fundamentally a two dimensional approach. Um, so this works, you know, 50 years ago, I think we can all agree that these folks did okay for their simple two dimensional chalk and talk uh, approach to, uh, to astrodynamics training. Um, but I don't know about you, but there have been times when I've looked out into the dimly lit lecture room after I've been chalking some Newton's laws and some gravitational flyby calculations and seen something a little bit like that. Just because we did it like that for decades uh, doesn't mean to say that there aren't ways of improving. And courtesy of modern technology, um, there are lots of ways of improving this and really changing the way that students engage with, with a challenging subject like astrodynamics and giving them some, some opportunity to, to really learn actively. Um, there are a few tools around. Um, the most well known is called Systems Toolkit from uh, AGI. Um, it's a fabulous piece of software with a fabulous price tag to match. And they have, uh, in, in olden times, the, the software was essentially free for educational use. But they've really started to tighten up on that now. Um, and. Uh, Having wrestled with their licensing arrangements for a few years, I came across um, this tool. So this is the general mission analysis tool, and it's a project that's coordinated by NASA, but it's an open source project. It involves industry as well as, uh, as NASA. And um, it looks suspiciously familiar to anybody who has, has some kind of exposure to SDK. I suspect that's not an accident. Um, and just like STK, it's validated. And for me, when I'm teaching astrodynamics or any kind of, of professional skill, it's really important that students understand the value of validation. The fact that this is software, yes, but it's tested against real world, real mission operations. And so uh, in, in the last few years, STK has been adopted, sorry, GMAT has been adopted by uh, NASA to support a number of missions um, and we talk a lot about that during the, the opening sessions of the workshops that, that I give. Um, it's got extensive interfaces to external uh, coding uh, and importantly it's free. You can get it for Windows, it now works very well on, uh, on Mac uh, and Linux, it's lots of documentation, lots of tutorials and there is a user forum. I find the forum is a little bit uh, variable in its, uh, in its usefulness, but uh, it does exist. So um, I don't have a lot of time, so I, I just want to highlight a few basic um, properties of GMAT before we look at the, a few examples of how we use it at, at Leicester. So the first point to make is that it's got a lot of extensible system interfaces, and that means that you don't have to constrain your work to the environment within GMAT. And in fact, that's really important because while GMAT and tools like SDK provide really nice eye candy, they prov provide useful visualization that can help students appreciate the concepts, um, you don't necessarily want to do all of your analysis within that system. And in fact, it's not practical. Some of the analysis that you might want to do involves some significant levels of, of computation and you need to be able to break out. So you can use MATLAB, Python, you can generate plugins uh, as well. There are also um, extensible model subsystems. What does that mean? Well, GMAT incorporates models for atmospheres, for different gravitational um, uh, parameters, for different kinds of um, calculation to solve mechanics problems. So in principle, you can add different models, different uh, atmospheric models or gravitation models or so on into the, into the system. Um, I toyed with the idea of doing some practical demonstrations up here and, and rapidly decided that that probably wasn't the way to go um, because things will inevitably go wrong. So I'm just going to show you a, a few screenshots. So this is the, 
the basic interface view, and you can see that it, if you've seen SDK before, it looks very similar. Uh, so there's a, a, a resources column on the left-hand side in which you define your spacecraft, your gravitating bodies, which you select uh, atmosphere models and so on. And then uh, you've got 3D and 2D windows, so you can look at the orbit or the trajectory in the reference frame of whichever object in the solar system you're interested in, and you can look at ground tracks, and you can define more of these windows as necessary. You can define new coordinate systems. For example, if you wanted to define some coordinate system that was the Earth-Jupiter barycenter for whatever reason, you can define that and you can plot your uh, outputs in that, in that window. Um, so at Leicester, we, we use this in a number of areas. We have a, a third year astrodynamic skills elective, but I also run um, our MSc astrodynamics module using something based around this workshop. Uh, I won't go into that in detail. We can talk about it in the afternoon sessions if, if necessary. Um, so this is really how I introduce my, uh, my students to the, uh, to the system. Um, so once we've gone through some basic introductions to fundamental orbital dynamics, so things like the trajectory equation, the energy equation, the relationships between uh, semi-major axis, semi-minor axis, and, and eccentricity, they can use GMAT to compare calculations with model outputs. So we can build a very simple uh, restricted two-body Keplerian problem. We can get the students to calculate various parameters, and we can then model that in GMAT. So just conveniently behind the coffee dispenser, there is a, uh, a model, a view of that um, scenario, and a whole set of numerical parameters which come out of this, which you can use for uh, time variable or static uh, analysis, and they can compare the, the results and experiment with that uh, um, uh, system. Okay. So again, I've, I've put some content in here which we might talk about around the table this afternoon if, if, if necessary. So this is a student example from one of my workshops, and this is looking at the J2 perturbation, calculating the inclination and altitude for a specific kind of sun-synchronous orbit. So in this lighting, it might be difficult to see, but this is the Earth-Sun vector. This is a rather large satellite, it seems, um, in orbit around the Earth. And what you can see from the eye candy generally is that that orbital plane is tracking the Earth-Sun line. But a 3D window isn't necessarily the best way to show that. So the students uh, uh, use the extensible interfaces and they use data from GMAT to plot something a little bit more meaningful. So in this case, for example, we've got the, um, uh, the right ascension of the sun as the solid line, and we've got a non-sun synchronous orbit and a sun synchronous orbit. So they can test their application of things like the um, uh, rate of change of the right ascension, the ascending node, um, and establish the relationship between inclination, orbital radius, and the sun synchronous condition. Um, so J2 is one of the perturbations. Here's another uh, very um, important perturbation. So this is east-west drift. And in GMAT, what we could do is switch between coordinate systems. So we can now switch into a planetidetic coordinate system. We can set initial conditions that describe the position of four geostationary satellites um, around the Earth. Two of these exist at the stable equilibrium points, and two of them exist at the unstable equilibrium points. Students tend to spend hours trying to set these up and failing because they set them up in Earth-centered inertial coordinates. Uh, and as soon as you show them planetidetic coordinates, it becomes much simpler. So you can do it within a minute. Uh, and if I run this again, so hopefully you can see, so I, I have four satellites up here, and two of these satellites remain fixed with respect to the um, uh, geographic features below, and two of them start to drift. And this gets us into discussions about station keeping, about mission lifetime uh, uh, constraints imposed by the need to burn fuel to keep your satellite on station, concepts like graveyard orbits. So. That simple demonstration, which we can set up 
within a few minutes leads on to a whole set of, of discussions and exploration of how you actually do your maneuvers. What, what are the requirements on the propulsion system for, for keeping a satellite in station if it's not at one of those equilibrium points? Uh, the, so we also have atmospheric models. For example, we have introduced an atmosphere. And so GMAT has a number of standard atmospheric models. So I'm using M size 90 here. And within that model, so you can see this is the, um, the definition window in the, in the bottom, might be difficult to, to see from the back. Um, but as well as defining the atmospheric model, we can define specific elements of the um, space weather conditions. So we can uh, set the solar flux, we can set the geomagnetic index. We do use this in um, courses on space weather and space plasma physics. So we can also use GMAT to support those uh, examples. I'm not gonna try rerunning that because bad things will happen. Um, but, but the outputs that you get from GMAT um, can help students to understand for orbits that are very low altitude and encounter significant amounts of atmospheric drag, you can see the effect on the um, spacecraft orbit lifetime. Um, this is without uh, an atmosphere uh, included in the model. This is two, orb uh, two um, identical satellites operating in slightly different um, solar states within the M size 90 uh, model. And you can see that there's a difference in the, um, uh, in the orbital decay characteristics. And because GMAT also includes physical parameters for the spacecraft, such as the coefficient of drag or the coefficient of reflectivity, if we want to incorporate the effects of, say, solar radiation pressure, um, it's, a, it's a, an enormous kind of playground for testing out ideas uh, relating to spacecraft system design, um, looking at the effects of, say, spacecraft having large solar arrays versus spacecraft with alternative power systems and what effect that has on the, on the mission. So we go beyond the Earth. Um, so this is some work that we did on, uh, this is a PROMA student uh, piece of work, where we sent a small swarm of spacecraft from the Earth to Jupiter. Uh, and the spacecraft were identical apart from having some very small differences in the initial conditions that were used for that orbit. And what you can see, let's run that again, slightly nervous about doing that. What you can see is that the, the spacecraft, when they encounter Jupiter, they're all, all together, but as soon as they start to feel Jupiter's gravitational field, they disperse. Um, and that's all very nice and pretty. But the point is that we teach the physics of uh, gravitational encounters. There are some very important relationships, for example, relationships between the eccentricity, the arrival velocity, the radius of periapsis, and the mass of the planet. Um, this is the relationship between the turning angle and the eccentricity. So these are fundamental parameters that are used when you want to plan an interplanetary mission using multiple gravity assists. And so the students can use this system to test their model outputs, experimental if you like, against the kind of predictions that you get from, from theory. Um, this is something that we call the synchro pair, because I'm a bit of a Red Arrows fan and I had a funny way of getting that in. So these are two identical spacecraft, um, but they encounter the planet in identical orbits, except that one comes from the trailing hemisphere and one through the leading hemisphere. And what you see there is that you get a change in your heliocentric um, uh, uh, energy. And this is the, the basic principle of using gravitation assist to modify spacecraft trajectories. So there's a whole lot of learning that takes place after that, after you've actually done the, the graphical work and understood the application of those. One thing I should say is that GMAT is not good for planning gravitational assist trajectories. Okay? It's, for this kind of work, you need uh, Monte Carlo um, simulations, and GMAT just isn't set up for that kind of thing. You can do this in STK, but even STK isn't the ideal um, environment. So we use uh, different codes. So we use PiCap and PyGMO. So these are ESA tools. 
which uh, so PyKEP is a Python implementation of a Keplerian uh, orbital mechanics toolbox. PyCMO is actually non-specific to orbital mechanics, but it's a set of non-linear optimization codes. And by combining those two things together, you can do some really great work on um, uh, calculating gravity assist, initial parameters, beneficial um, encounters, and so on. And one of the easy gets from, from PyCAP and PyGMO is the ability to produce things like this. So these are pork chop plots. Uh, we can use these to identify um, launch windows, windows constrained by the energetics of the launch vehicle, for example. We can output right ascension and declination of launch asymptotes, and we can use those as initial starting conditions in GMAT. So PyCAP and PyGMO provide us with inputs to GMAP, which can then be used to, to model uh, gravity assist encounters. So this is some work done by my um, PhD student, Sam Frampton, with apologies to Lucy, because um, we stole Sam from Lucy, sorry about that. Um, but he's really good, which is why we stole him. Um, uh, so these are gravity assist uh, trajectories looking at encounters with Uranus. So these are many thousands of gravity assist uh, attempts, some of which proved to be very beneficial. And so we can use uh, PyGMO and PyCAP to identify the most beneficial of those trajectories and then extract the parameters to, uh, to understand what the starting conditions and what the, uh, the parameters of each gravity encounter are leading to those. Uh, to, uh, oh, to finish. So uh, I'll just finish with the, the, the final mission challenge. So we, we go through a set of... of uh, sort of directed explorations in GMAT, but at the very end I give them a little Christmas present. Um, so I give them a, uh, a final challenge, and I essentially say, this is what you're going to model. I go away over Christmas, don't even think about emailing me, uh, and come back um, and show us how you've achieved this particular uh, um, challenge. So last year I wanted them to analyze the Type H hybrid Apollo lunar trajectory. Um, so these are the trajectories which departed from free return and then um, allowed the Apollo program to access different regions of, of, of the moon. Um, so that's exactly what they did. Um, several groups got the full solution, including correct splashdown dates. Um, the way that we do this is um, you can use GMAT to present your work. You can use outputs of numerical models. You may not use PowerPoint, as I'm doing here. You may not use the gift of interpretive dance, because when you take away PowerPoint, students then start to kind of do this kind of thing, and that's no good either. We use an approach which is adopted in the ESA concurrent design facility. Okay, if you're going to present something, don't waste your hours presenting a, a PowerPoint presentation, like I'm doing. Um, use the model itself, which means that when you get to the end of your presentation and you get to the Q&A, if somebody says, what would have happened if you did this or have you checked that? You just go to the model and you rerun it and you say, okay, let's have a look and see what happens. And that's what they do. And, and this is a real challenge for them. They don't like this to begin with. But by the end of that session, um, they really embrace it because it turns into a really active discussion. Um, so I think this has worked out very well. Um, so behind GMAT, uh, GMAT's uh, visual interface is, is a full scripting language. And very often to get to really get the details, to get access to the, um, to the best approaches, we get the students to release their grip on the, on the, the nice GUI interface and start looking at the scripting. Uh, and you can do optimization work in scripting very well. Um, so this is a typical mission sequence where we have a series of stages, Earth launch, arrival at the, at the moon, circularization, descending to the surface, uh, departure from the moon, trans-Earth injection, arrival at the Earth in the right part of the right ocean at the right time. Um, and not all students got it, but a number did. Um, so I don't think these are going to work. Okay, so a little bit quick, but this is the hybrid trajectory. So you can see that they've succeeded in launching from the Earth to the Moon. They're in orbit around the Moon. 
then a trans-Earth injection, which leads them back to the Earth, splashing down at the right point in the right ocean. I was quite impressed. I didn't expect them to get that level of agreement, but they did. And they go away and they invest an awful lot of time doing research. Uh, the, the, the information that we have is that students actually like this. They go away and they're talking over Christmas and playing with, with, uh, with the different approaches. Okay, uh, I think I've overrun my time. So, takeaway points, it's open source, it's free, it's validated, it works. It's not perfect, but it is really the, an excellent basis for a, for, a, for a very interactive, engaging astrodynamics uh, module. We've really used this now as, a, as an integral component, not just of the taught modules, but of um, student projects as well. Um, you can use black, gray, or white box implementation. So you can, you can reveal as much of the fundamental physics as you want. So I can also use this um, for early stage secondary school um, demos, but without revealing as much of the, uh, of the detail. Uh, it's extendable, uh, and there's lots of documentation. And if you want to find out more, we, um, we published this in the um, Journal of Learning and Teaching in Higher Education, so you can find the link on, online. And uh, there's a few resources there which you can get in the um, presentation file, which I think are these going to be visible, available after the session. So there's a few links there with some um, ideas for uh, uh, ways of attempting initial condition calculations as well as the, the, the GMAT itself. So uh, that was rather rapid, but I hope that's useful. And obviously this afternoon, I'm happy to go through and give some demonstrations, which I shied away from doing in the, uh, in the talk part. So, okay, thanks a lot.